Hello, this is Chef John from FoodWishes.com with the ultimate mashed potatoes. That's right, this is dedicated to everyone who's posting a no-fat or low-fat mashed potato recipe for the holidays. Please, food gods, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because not only are holiday table mashed potatoes supposed to have butter in it, they're supposed to have a ridiculous amount of butter in it. So that's exactly what I'm going to show you how to do. But fair warning, what you're about to witness can never be unseen. But if you think you're up for it, let's get started. And one huge tip here, make sure you get potatoes that are the same size. All right, all three of these potatoes were just over a pound each, which means once I trim them, I'm gonna have about three pounds of potatoes to work with, which is gonna make about eight generous portions. And then once those are peeled, we're gonna quarter them. And to do that, we'll cut it in half. And by the way, if the potato tapers a little bit, always cut the tapered end a little longer. See that, I didn't go exactly in half. All right, that'll compensate a little bit for the difference in girth. So we'll cut them in half, we'll cut those halves in half. And that's a pretty good method for getting even sized pieces. By the way, in our original mashed potato video, we cut them in half lengthwise, but we've updated. And then once those potatoes are cut, we're gonna rinse them very thoroughly. In fact, you may have noticed a little dirt on my fingers when I'm peeling and cutting those. I only rinse my potatoes once. Because you have to rinse the starch off when they're cut anyway, why bother rinsing them before you peel them? That's like doubling your work. And yes, it was a long way to go to explain that little spot of dirt on my finger. Okay, so once those are rinsed thoroughly, we're gonna drain them and dump them into our pot of cold water that we're gonna generously salt, by the way, like very generously. So our ultimate mashed potatoes are actually gonna start off seasoned, and we'll go ahead and bring that up to a boil on the highest heat possible, and then we'll adjust our heat to maintain a nice steady simmer, and we'll cook these until perfectly tender. And since that's gonna take a little while, we can go ahead and prep our butter. And I hope you're sitting down, because that's how much we're gonna use. That is one pound of European butter, also known as the expensive butter, but it is gorgeous, very low water content. It almost has a clay-like texture. But anyway, we're gonna take a pound of butter, we're gonna cut it up in chunks, and it's very critical this butter comes up to room temperature. It would be perfect if this butter got up to like 60, 65 degrees. And I'm not sure if you've crunched the numbers yet, but yes, we're doing a three to one ratio, three pounds of potatoes to one pound of butter. And I realize that sounds completely insane, but on the blog post, I'm gonna explain why that's not only not insane, but it is an incredibly rational and absolutely reasonable thing to do. So please check that out, especially if you're a fan of airtight arguments. All right, so our butter's prepped, and we'll head back over to the stove to check our potatoes, and we really want these to be tender. All right, so carefully check with a spoon and a knife. That knife should go in with almost no effort. I mean, there's just nothing more evil than mashed potatoes with chunks of uncooked potato in it. Yes, worse than Satan, way worse. So we're gonna make sure these are very tender, at that point, we're gonna drain them very thoroughly. We don't want any water in here. And yes, if they've been cooked enough, they're gonna collapse like that. That does not mean they're overcooked. That means they're perfectly cooked. All right, so we're gonna dump in our very well-drained potatoes. We're gonna turn our heat onto medium-low. We definitely wanna keep some heat under this. And we're gonna start mashing with a wire potato masher. All right, check it out. Accept no substitutes. The old wire potato masher. Nothing works as good. And during this first phase, all we're doing is breaking them up. All right, there's no butter, there's no milk. Just go around until you think they're mashed. Oh, and by the way, one of the great things about having this much butter in the recipe, you don't really have to worry about overmixing. Okay, so do not be concerned you're overworking this. It's gonna be perfect. All right, so after that initial mashing, we'll go ahead and dump in some pepper and some salt. And we're gonna adjust the seasoning later, but I know I'm gonna need some. And we'll also throw in about a quarter of the butter chunks. And we'll go ahead and mix that up with the masher until the butter just about disappears. And by the way, do not forget throughout this entire process, your heat is on medium low. We want to keep everything nice and hot. Don't forget that butter's only room temperature. And once that first addition of butter is mashed in, we're going to switch to a wire whisk. We're going to dump in another quarter of the butter. We're going to mix that in with the whisk. When it almost disappears, add the next quarter of butter. And simply repeat until all the butter's gone. So in a way, this is almost like we're doing a butter sauce where we're mixing in the butter and it's kind of emulsifying in. And you'll notice when you get down to that last addition of butter, things are getting really light and creamy and awesome looking. And then when that last addition of butter is whipped in, we're gonna go ahead and finish this with just a splash of hot milk, just like a quarter cup. I microwave mine. And that's just gonna lighten up and loosen things up just a touch. And we'll give that one last whipping. And at this point, you're really, really gonna wanna grab a fork. Not only to taste one of the most delicious things in the history of the universe, but you have to taste and adjust the seasoning at this point. Listen to me now and hear me later. If this does not have enough salt, it will not taste good. All right, so mine was almost perfect, but it did need a little more salt and the obligatory shake of cayenne. And once that's mixed in, we can go ahead and turn off our heat and serve. So go ahead and transfer those into your tater bowl. Do not garnish with anything except possibly a few chives. And that's only if you're taking pictures. This needs absolutely nothing, especially if you're serving it as part of a big holiday meal. 
And yes, when you bring that to the table, people will be thinking, hmm, those mashed potatoes aren't white, they're almost butter colored. Uh, it's probably just the light. I'm sure it doesn't look that way from insane amounts of butter. Oh, but it does. And seriously, one taste and it will all make sense. It is just beyond description. And there's a reason all those Michelin star chefs make their potatoes this way. Because they're just so above and beyond what we usually enjoy as mashed potatoes, that they almost become another type of food. Some kind of butter potato hybrid. Potato? Actually, let me work on that. So if you're into enjoying and sharing with your guests a proper bowl of mashed potatoes this holiday season, I really hope you give these a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. French onion green bean casserole. That's right, the classic green bean casserole side dish tricked out. Do people still say that? Tricked out with some of my favorite flavors from French onion soup, specifically caramelized onions and Gruyere cheese. So here we go. So I'm gonna start by slicing up a couple onions, but not across the grain, which is how you usually slice onions. See the grain, see those lines in the onion? Usually you cut across that. But for this recipe, I want you to turn the onion and cut slices with the grain. That will let the pieces of onion stay together a little better, which I think works better for this recipe. Having said that, slice them any darn way you want. They're your onions. Okay, when the onions are sliced, we're gonna heat some butter in a large skillet over medium heat. And when it's melted, you're gonna dump in your onions with a pinch of salt, and we're gonna cook those until caramelized. And how long is that gonna take? Mine took about 15 minutes, but you'll know because they'll be soft and browned. If you gotta back the heat down just a hair, go ahead. All right, you don't want them turning black before they soften, but those are looking beautiful right there. So I'm gonna turn off the heat and I'm gonna reserve those until needed. All right, next up is our white sauce, which is very simple. A little bit of butter melted in a saucepan, again over medium heat. We're gonna dump in some flour. We're gonna whisk that together. So once you've cooked that flour for about three minutes in the butter, we're gonna slowly whisk in our cold milk, slowly at first. You know the drill. Once you get that first half cup or so in, you could pour it quicker. Season it with some salt, some cayenne pepper, and some freshly grated nutmeg. Go buy a nutmeg and grate it fresh. It's a huge difference. All right, we're gonna stir that and we're gonna bring that up to a simmer on medium heat. I'm also gonna add a pinch of dry thyme. You can use fresh, but I actually like dry thyme better here. Like all Roubaix sauces, that's gonna thicken up as it comes to a simmer. And as soon as it does, let it cook a couple minutes, two or three minutes, stirring with a spatula, turn it off and set it aside. That's done. All right, next we're on to prepping the beans. If you're on your grandma's porch, you can snap them like this. Pinch that end, pinch that end, but that's kind of slow. A more professional kitchen method would be this. Line up the beans, tap it with the flat of your knife, slice off the ends, turn it around, do the same thing to the other side, give it the old tapa tapa, and just cut down like that. Very quick, very easy. When those are trimmed, I'm also gonna cut them in half, just to make serving easier. All right, once your beans are prepped, we're gonna boil those in salted water for about three or four minutes. We're not trying to cook them, we're just trying to take the raw edge off, okay? So they're gonna basically still be crisp, they're just not gonna be raw tasting, all right? So just three or four minutes is all you need. Pull them out of that water with a strainer, let them drain very well. We don't want watery bean casserole. And set those aside. So we've been having fun so far, but it even gets more fun now because we get to do final assembly. We're gonna take a nine by 13 casserole dish and in the bottom, we're gonna spread out half of our caramelized onions. Once those are spread out, I want you to dump over all the drained beans. Definitely use your hands so you burn yourself to spread them out. Or if you're smart, use tongs. All right, I'm gonna season those with salt and pepper. There's nothing worse than bland vegetables. Translation, under salted vegetables. I'm gonna dump over our white sauce, spread that over evenly, okay? Then Gruyere cheese. So we're gonna divide our Gruyere in half. We're gonna place half the Gruyere down at this point. We're gonna to top that with the rest of the onions, okay? Spread it evenly. You can just use the back of a spoon to press that down into that white sauce and cheese. Then we're gonna take some breadcrumbs. I'm using panko, but any breadcrumb will work. With a little bit of melted butter, we're gonna sprinkle that over the top, Spread it evenly, of course. Why would you spread it unevenly? All right, over the top of the crumbs goes the last half of the Gruyere cheese, 
By the way, a wonderful, amazing Swiss cheese, classic with French onion soup. And then to finish, the final touch, a little dusting of Reggiano Parmesan cheese, just to stay in shape. We're going to pop that in a 375 degree oven for about 30 minutes until it looks like that. Look at that. So beautiful. And of course, you're going to want to let that sit for 10, 15 minutes to sort of solidify and then spoon it up and eat it. Unbelievably delicious. I mean, just regular green bean casserole with those fake fried onions on top is good. But this is a whole nother level. Sweet, savory, cheesy, that amazing crunchy topping. Just a fork full of awesomeness. A side dish for any occasion, especially around the holidays. This would be just extra, extra special. Anyway, head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts as usual. And as always, enjoy. Rosemary and honey pull apart dinner rolls. That's right, when those fancy holiday meals roll around, you can't just put any kind of roll on the table. You have to make something special, and these are kind of special. And if you thought these were too complicated or hard to make, well, think again. These are actually quite simple to make, and here's how you do it. So we're going to start by putting one package of dry active yeast in the bowl of our stand mixer, and then we're going to pour over a quarter cup of very warm but not too hot water. All right, as you know, if it's too hot, it will kill the yeast. So just give that a stir, and we're just going to let that sit there for about 10-15 minutes, and what will happen is it will start getting foamy and thick, and you know that the yeast is alive and it's all good in the microorganism hood. Okay, so we're going to set that aside. We're going to go over to the stove where I'm going to have you over low heat melt some butter in some milk. So put the heat on low and just let it sit there until the butter almost melts just like that. And then just turn it off. All right, we just want that tepid, just barely warm. Again, if it's too hot, you're going to kill the yeast. So just set that aside. We're going to go back over to the mixing bowl and we're going to look to see if the yeast is alive. And mine is. See how it's kind of thick and foamy and bubbly? That means the yeast is living. So to that, we're going to add some honey. It's going to give the rolls a little bit of sweetness. I usually put about a tablespoon. If you want it a little sweeter, you could put two tablespoons. We're also going to throw in some salt and some finely minced rosemary. All right, not a ton. Rosemary is very strong. So be careful not to overdo it. And then we're going to dump in our flour, but not all of it, like 75% of it. And why not all of it? Because I'll explain in a minute. And then finally dump in your warm milk butter mixture. We're going to throw that on the mixer with a dough hook because we're making dough. We're going to give that a mix and it's going to be way too sticky to form a dough. But that's good because what we want to do is just gradually add flour until it just pulls away from the sides. So after that initial mixing, you can see it's super sticky and way too wet. I'm going to dump in flour about a quarter cup at a time. I'll let it turn for a minute. I'll scrape down the side and I'll keep doing that until this happens, until the dough has absorbed enough flour where it just barely pulls away from the sides. It's still very soft. It's still very sticky, but there is enough flour in there that this will pull together into a dough ball. Once that happens, you're going to let that knead for about six minutes until you have a very elastic and again, soft, slightly sticky dough. All right, when you pull it out of the bowl, it should be slightly tacky, but not enough where it's going to stick to your fingers. If it does, add a little more flour and knead it more. But that's perfect right there. I'm going to douse that with some olive oil a good amount. I'm going to make sure it's totally coated. We're going to cover that with foil and put it in a warm spot for about an hour and a half to two hours until it doubles in size. And you'll know because it'll be like twice as big. All right, so that's looking good. For me, that was about an hour and 40 minutes. We're going to dump that onto our cutting board. Now you'll notice I don't have any flour down because that dough still has a good amount of oil on it, so it's really not that sticky. If you're scared, you can rub a little bit of olive oil on your board in your hands. And what we're going to do is we're going to form that into a rectangle, but only to help us portion these dinner rolls. If you want, you can just start pulling off pieces and making the balls, but I find it easier to make a rectangle. Then I'll cut it in equal size strips, and if I cut each strip into the same number of pieces, I know each of my rolls will be basically the same size. All right, so nothing too complicated. It just helps you portion. And of course, at this point, I will note, you can make these any size you want, as long as they're the same size, so they bake the same. And then once your dough is portioned, you're simply going to take each piece and form it into a small ball. And how you want to do this, you want to fold the four corners up underneath itself, so you're keeping a nice smooth surface, and you're pulling and pinching that dough towards the bottom, so the seams will be underneath, and the top will be a perfectly smooth sphere. And just as a side note, sometimes when I'm doing this balling, I will also do a little bit of shot calling, but that's only if I have time. 
All right. Once those are all balled up, we're going to carefully place those on a lined baking sheet. We want nice, neat rows and columns. And you'll notice they're almost but not quite touching. And this is very critical if you want the pull apart effect. All right. If you put them too far away, you're just going to have little rolls, not the same deal. All right, you want to call these pull apart rolls, you better have something to pull apart. So we want to get them very close, but not quite touching. You can see right there, that's kind of the perfect distance. All right, once those are on the pan, we're going to take an egg wash, which in my case was just a beaten egg with about a teaspoon of milk. I'm going to paint that over the top. It's going to give them a beautiful color. And then last but not least, we're going to take some coarse sea salt and just sprinkle a few crystals on each roll. Again, we're doing this to up the fancy quotient because this is a special occasion roll. And then once those have the salt, the last step before baking is called the proofing, which means we got to let these rise for about 20, 30 minutes. I just put mine in the oven. The oven's off, of course. So I put them in the oven for about a half hour, after which they look like this. So I don't know if they're going to double in size, but they're going to be significantly larger. I'm going to take those out. I'm going to leave them on top of the stove while we preheat our oven to 375. When the oven's preheated, put those in the center and bake them for 20 minutes until beautifully browned. They're going to look like this, which I think looks spectacular. You can see the egg wash gave them that gorgeous color. That salt really does give them an extra special look. By the way, if you wanted to use sesame seeds or poppy seeds, you could put that on instead of the salt. And of course, you can serve these warm, but don't serve them hot. But I'm going to pull one off here hot so I could burn my finger. But anyway, let me crack this open so you can see the gorgeous inside. Just a very classic white light dinner roll. I don't have any food to eat these with, so I'm just going to put a little piece of butter on there. Oh, yeah. Just pure, unadulterated deliciousness. And it has that gorgeous aroma of rosemary, that subtle sweetness from the honey. Just a very, very excellent dinner roll. And how many people would really know the difference that you made these from scratch and didn't buy a package of frozen rolls? Who cares? That's not the point. We don't make these to impress other people. We make these to impress ourselves and, of course, other people. Anyway, as you saw, there's really not a lot of work involved in these, so I really hope you give them a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info, as usual. And as always, enjoy! Candied yams! That's right, and of course by candied yams, I mean candied sweet potatoes. Since, believe it or not, you can't actually buy real yams at the grocery store. It's true. People that sell such things figured out a long time ago that if you call orange flesh sweet potatoes yams, they actually sell a lot faster. But anyway, that's not really going to affect this recipe at all. And I only passed it along in case that know-it-all foodie relative of yours shows up and points at these and says, hey, you know those aren't yams, right? And then you'll be like, yeah, everybody knows that. So anyway, technically incorrect names aside, let's go ahead and get started. And what I have here is about three pounds of sweet potatoes that we're going to call yams for the rest of the video. And what we'll do before we start peeling and cutting these is get our water ready. And all that means is add a couple quarts of cold fresh water to a pot and stir in two nice rounded tablespoons of salt. And it's in this we're going to give our sweet potatoes a little pre-cooking before we caramelize them in our glaze. And then what we'll do once that's set is go ahead and peel our yams and then cut them as shown. So let's go ahead and remove that skin as well as trim off those tips. And then because of the tapered shape, I like to cut two pieces off either end at which point we're going to cut this lengthwise. But be careful, these things are a little brittle, so start slow with just a little bit of pressure. And once we know we're centered, we can use a rocking motion and a little more pressure, and we will split that in half, of course keeping our fingers out of the way. And then once that's split, we'll simply cut it across into about, I don't know, one and a half, two inch pieces. And as usual, the exact size you pick is not the big deal. The more important issue is that you try to get them as uniform as possible. And not just for visual appeal, although that's part of it, but the real reason is so they all cook in about the same time. And then what we'll do once our yams are cut is transfer those into our cold water, at which point we can head to the stove, where we will place this over high heat and bring it up to a simmer. And then all we need to do once that starts bubbling is reduce our heat a little bit and simmer these until they're almost but not quite tender, which is going to take a few minutes, but I can't give you a time because it's going to depend on how big you cut yours. So just like me, you're going to have to test with a knife. And for me, these were still a little firm, so I'm going to let them go. And what we can do so we don't waste time is while we're waiting for our yams, we can go ahead and put together our glaze. So into a large skillet, preferably nonstick, we will add one fairly giant chunk of butter, as well as some brown sugar. I'm using light brown sugar, but I'm guessing dark would work as well. And then for a little extra holiday touch, I'm going to also add a little bit of maple syrup. And if you're keeping score at home, I like to use grade B. And if I remember, I'll tell you why on the blog post. But anyway, moving on, I'm also going to add some freshly squeezed lemon juice 
which is my big twist on this recipe, since usually orange juice is used, which for me with all this sugar, not to mention a sweet root vegetable, is just too sweet of a juice. And yes, I can totally see that lemon seed now that unbelievably I didn't see when I poured in the juice. But it's fine, at least people will know I use freshly squeezed lemon. So just ignore that. In fact, let me distract you by adding some cinnamon, as well as some ground ginger, and then let's finish up with a little bit of cayenne, and a generous pinch of salt, and that is gonna be it for our glaze. What we'll do is bring that to the stove and place it on medium high heat, and we will cook that over medium high, stirring occasionally, until everything melts and starts bubbling, and once that happens, we'll cook it for just a couple minutes until it sort of starts to thicken up and those bubbles get a little bigger and everything's starting to look a lot stickier, at which point we can turn off the heat and wait for our yams, which should be just about perfect now. So we'll give those another test with our knife. And like I said, what we're shooting for is something that's almost tender, but not quite. Because what's gonna happen is these are gonna finish cooking in the glaze. So once our chunks of yam are about 90% tender, We'll grab our strainer and transfer those into our glaze. And don't worry, it's totally fine if you get a few drops of water in this as you're transferring. That's all part of the show. And then all we need to do once our yams are in the pan is crank our heat up to high and cook these stirring or flipping occasionally until they are cooked through and our glaze is thickened to our liking. Not my liking, your liking. Okay, so not a very complicated procedure. We'll just keep an eye on things and we'll keep those yams moving around while at the same time checking for doneness with our poking knife. And while we definitely don't want these so soft they fall apart, we really do want them nice and tender. And mine were getting very close, but I decided they needed a few more seconds. And sure, if you feel like showing off, and you mastered our pan flipping technique, that would work here, but be careful. If you do it wrong, you're going to have an incredibly terrible mess to clean off your stove. Not to mention a few serious burns. So only try that if you've practiced, and or you've had a couple glasses of wine. But anyway, like I said, we're going to simply continue to cook that on high until our yams are tender and our glaze is thickened to our liking. And for me personally, this is about how far I like to go. All right, I definitely want a nice shiny thick glaze, but I don't want a super thick, gloppy sort of caramel sauce. So I think that's perfect right there. And other than giving this a little taste, be careful, it's hot. But other than giving this a taste, we are pretty much ready to serve. So we'll go ahead and pull that off the heat and transfer that into a slightly more attractive serving vessel. And once we've done that, of course, we're also going to spoon over any and all extra glaze over the top. And by the way, you didn't hear this from me, but this stuff might actually be better over ice cream than it is over these yams. It's true. I've heard that from people. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and serve that up. And that, my friends, if I do say so myself, looks absolutely gorgeous. And if we served it like this, exactly zero people would complain. But for that little extra special holiday touch, I'm going to go ahead and sprinkle over some chopped pistachio. And sure, pecans would be more traditional, but I really enjoy that color contrast between the green and the dark orange. But anyway, that's up to you. You guys are the Uncle Sam's of your candy yams. But I'm going to go pistachio because of that thing I said a few seconds ago. And that's it. Our candy yams are ready to enjoy. And I don't want to pat myself on the back too much here. I mean, that's what the comments are for. But I really do think using lemon juice over the orange juice here makes a huge difference. And generally, I'm not into these sweet holiday side dishes. I mean, if it's top of mini marshmallows, I don't want any. But while relatively sweet, I think this version actually retains a lot of its savoriness. Or at least enough. And like any great holiday side dish, this is amazing hot, incredible warm, and fantastic room temperature. So that should take a little pressure off when you're trying to time this with the rest of the meal. But anyway, that's it. Candied yams. Once a year, we are allowed to eat root vegetables in candied form. And this is that time of year. So I really do hope you give these a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Gravy Stuff Stuffing Muffins. That's right, not only are we making muffins with Thanksgiving stuffing, we are also stuffing that stuffing with something. And that something would be a delicious country gravy. And I know it might sound kind of crazy, because it sort of is. But these really were truly amazing. And they're a must try for any stuffing fanatic like me. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our country gravy, which is gonna start by melting some butter in a saucepan over medium high heat, to which we will add any kind of raw sausage meat. And what I have here is one link of mild turkey Italian sausage that I removed from the casing. 
And what we're going to do here is crumble this up as it browns, but also brown it up as it crumbles. And as usual with this kind of stuff, I think the smaller the better. And while you could certainly use a regular pork Italian sausage for this, or even the more traditional pork breakfast sausage, since we're eventually going to shove this stuff into a Thanksgiving-themed stuffing muffin, I thought the turkey would work out even better. But anyway, like I said, we'll go ahead and cook that over medium-high heat until it's been crumbled up fairly finely and starts to brown up and take on some nice color. And then what we'll do once it looks a little something like this is go ahead and switch to a whisk, and we will toss in a little bit of all-purpose flour, which is going to combine with that melted butter and the fat that rendered out of the sausage to create a paste we call a roux, R-O-U-X. And that's what's eventually going to thicken our gravy. So we'll stir that in and cook it for about two minutes. And then once we've taken the raw edge off that flour, we'll go ahead and toss in some freshly sliced green onions. And we will cook those stirring, but only for like a minute. Okay, I do not want to brown those onions because I don't want them getting soft and sweet. I think here we want them to retain a little bit of sharpness and a little bit of texture. So we'll only cook those for about a minute before pouring in our cold milk. And because that milk is very cold, and that roux is very hot, we're not going to have to worry about getting any lumps. Okay, we actually have a t-shirt that says that. Cold milk, hot roux, no lumps. And then all we have to do here is cook this stirring until it comes back to a boil, at which point as you're about to see, it's going to thicken up beautifully. So we will just keep stirring, still on medium-high heat, and eventually we should end up with something that looks a little something like this. And right here I'm going to go ahead and switch to a spatula, so maybe you can get a little better idea of how thick we're talking. Okay, which is pretty thick. And then to finish this off, we'll go ahead and season it with some salt, a few shakes of cayenne, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. And that's it. We'll stir that in and just cook it for like one more minute, at which point we can turn off the heat because we're done. And all we have left to do is carefully transfer this into a bowl because we're going to want to let this cool all the way down before we use it. And yes, as you may have noticed, this is a little thicker than your classic country gravy, but for it to work as a stuffing for a stuffing muffin, it really does need to be at least this thick. And if you make it ahead like I did, once it cools down, we can wrap that up and pop it in the fridge until needed. Which, if you have time, is the way to go. Since the colder and thicker this is, the easier it's going to be to work with. And that's it. Once our country gravy is done, we can move on to the stuffing, into which the stuff we just made will be stuffed. And that's going to start with a whole bunch of butter set over medium-high heat, in which we're going to saute some diced celery and onions, along with a nice big pinch of salt. And what we'll do is cook that stirring for about four or five minutes, or until the onions just start to turn translucent. And then once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and add our poultry seasoning, as well as a whole bunch of freshly ground black pepper. And we'll give that a stir and cook it for another minute. And in case you're wondering, poultry seasoning is mostly just dried sage and thyme, and maybe rosemary and a few other things. And it's one of those ingredients that gives Thanksgiving stuff in its signature flavor. So don't skip that, please. And if you have to Google how to make your own, go ahead. Very important. And that's it. To finish this off, we'll go ahead and add our chicken or turkey broth or stock. All right, preferably homemade. But as usual, do what you have to do. And a packaged broth will work out just fine. And then all we have to do before we can use this to make stuffing is wait for it to come to a boil. Which, as you know, if you're staring at it, will never happen. So while we wait, we can go ahead and grab our bread cubes, which hopefully we have in a nice big mixing bowl. And in case you're keeping score at home, I did this with sourdough. But of course, your favorite stuffing mix will work. And then even though we're using some dry herbs in the wet ingredients, I think we also want to add some fresh herbs in here as well, which I'm doing with some parsley, sage, and thyme. And if you want to finish the quartet, you could also add a little bit of rosemary. That's up to you. I mean, you are after all the peaches and herb of your stuffing muffins fresh herb. But be careful, too much rosemary can really overpower things. And then what we'll do once our broth finally starts to boil is we'll go ahead and very carefully pour it over the top. And at first it might seem like it's too much, but you'll see as long as your bread cubes were completely dry, it will all get absorbed in very nicely. And by the way, you see all that steam that's being released as we stir? That is a good thing. Because the last ingredient in this is going to be some beaten eggs. And it would be really nice if those don't scramble. So what we'll do is mix the broth in first. And by the time we're done, most of that heat's going to have dissipated and we can go ahead and safely pour in our eggs. And then we'll give that one more final mix. And basically that's it. A fairly straightforward, classic herb stuffing. Or technically dressing if you don't put this in a bird, which we're not. Except stuffed dressing muffins don't sound as good. So I'm going with stuffing here. But anyway, once all that's been mixed up, 
We will go ahead and transfer that into a very, very, very generously buttered muffin tin. And so as to get these as even as possible, a good strategy here is to fill them up to the top, and then go around with the extra topping each one with about the same amount. And yes, as you can see, we are going to pile these up nice and high. And then what we'll do once our muffin pan has been stuffing, is take a wet finger and make a nice big hole into the center of each one. And while we do want to poke down pretty far, we do not want to go all the way to the bottom. Okay, so try to stop about an inch from the pan. Oh, and the only reason we're wetting our finger is that it just helps prevent that stuff from sticking to our skin. And that's it, you've probably already figured out the next step. We'll go ahead and pull our gravy from the fridge and place about two tablespoons, give or take, into each hole. And because we made our gravy so thick, we don't have to worry too much about it leaking through the sides. But having said that, try to get it as centered as you can. And then once our stuffy muffins have been stuffed, we will use two damp hands to sort of pull up and press over that excess stuffing around the sides, hopefully successfully sealing all that gravy inside. And there's basically two different ways you can go here. You can use this method, where we put all our stuffing into the muffin pan first, and then just pull it up the sides like you see me doing here to seal. Or if you're into extra steps, you could if you want just reserve like 12 spoonfuls of the stuffing, and then use that on top to cover the hole, which is basically going to work about the same. But either way, as long as that gravy is centered, and mostly covered by the bread, we're going to be okay. In fact, because we're going to cook this in a hot oven, even if you smear a little bit of that gravy on the surface, it's still going to crust over and look amazing and work perfectly. And that's it. Once those are set, we'll go ahead and brush the tops very generously with melted butter, which is going to help us achieve even a darker, crustier surface. Plus, when you're talking stuffing, you can't really have too much butter. And that's it. Those are now ready to transfer into the center of a 400 degree oven for about 20 minutes or so. Oh, and speaking of butter, because these might leak a little bit, I did put a pan on the bottom rack. But anyway, we'll do these at 400 for about 20 minutes, or until they look like this. Oh yeah, those are some handsome stuffing muffins if I do say so myself. And of course, it's normal to want to eat something this delicious right away, but we really do want to let them sit and cool for about five minutes in the pan before we try to remove them. Otherwise, they might break apart. And yes, of course, you could use some paper liners if you want, but I didn't bother. Because if you let them sit for about five or 10 minutes, they should lift out easily just like this. And then what we'll do to finish these off is, of course, top them with your regular turkey gravy. And in a perfect world, I would also have all the other Thanksgiving fixings around this. But I don't. But to hopefully make it up to you, I'm going to top this with some freshly sliced green onions. And that's it. My country gravy stuff, stuff and muffin was ready to enjoy. So let me go ahead and slice in so you can see what's going on. And what's going on, if everything's gone according to plan, is a perfect muffin of stuffing with a crispy, crusty, buttery exterior, with a soft, moist, custardy interior, plus in the center a beautiful nugget of molten country gravy. And speaking of gravy, since that turkey gravy was right next to me, I couldn't help myself and drizzle down a little more. And that, my friends, really was tremendous. Are right, you hand me some plain Thanksgiving stuffing, and I'm a happy guy, but when I get to enjoy one that has not one, but two gravies, that right there takes it up to a whole other level. And as far as the flavor goes, the funny thing is, I'm not a huge sausage stuffing guy. Okay, I really do prefer more of a traditional plain herb stuffing. But for whatever reason, having the sausage in the country gravy somehow seems to work out even better than if we'd put the sausage in the stuffing itself. Alright, I can't really explain it, so I'll stop trying. But it really was fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and take one more bite before finishing up by showing you how cool these are going to look in a basket, possibly next to a big bowl of persimmons on your holiday table. And your family will be like, what kind of dinner rolls are those? And you'll be like, dinner rolls? Those are gravy stuff stuff and muffins. Or if you don't want to confuse people, just serve them right in the pan. But either way, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.